what happens is, oh, I'm gonna leave and I'm just gonna be a writer. And right. I had one boss that I had at the time said, well, if anyone could just quit their job and become a writer, then everyone would do it. And I looked at him and I said, well, I don't think everyone wants to do that, first off. But second off, you're acting like I'm the first person in the history of the world who's decided to become a writer. You're listening to What the Hell is Michael Jammin Talking About? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about creativity, I'm talking about writing, and I'm talking about reinventing yourself through the arts. Hey everyone, it's Michael Jammin. I got a very special guest today. Uh, so today, this guy's I've been a fan of his work for a long time, and I discovered him a couple of years ago. It's Joshua Fields Milburn. He's half of the minimalists, and the, he, they, these guys did a documentary. I'm going to give him a nice, a nice proper introduction. They did a documentary that I discovered, which and the message was so important. It's on minimalism, and it's basically how you can live with more by having less, how you're richer by having less. And I just found that not, not only did I find the message so important, but I found their journey that these two guys put them on, put themselves on to be so inspiring. Just to give you a little bit of backstory before I before I finally let this guy get a word in edgewise. Um, is that so so Joshua grew up poor. Uh, parents uh, al- parents suffered and struggled with alcoholism. He decided, um, I'm speaking for him now, but this is what I picked up from the documentary, that he didn't want to be poor when he was an adult. I'm not going through that. So he managed to get jobs in management where he's actually making a good living, he's making money. And then he just, and then he, at some point he realized, wait, this is not making me happy. And then he did a complete, you know, about face and reinvented himself. So Joshua, thank you so much for joining me. Let's hear you talk. For, let's hear you talk now. Oh, Michael, thanks, thanks <laughs> so much for having me. I, um, yeah, it's funny. I did grow up really poor and I thought the reason we were so unhappy when I was growing up is we didn't have money and not knowing that like all these other things that were actually chaotic in my life some of the things you mentioned alcohol abuse drug abuse physical Mm -hmm. abuse and violence in the home and extreme poverty was was a part of it right it was a part of that milieu of of discontent and i just hyper focused on that one component so when i turned 18 i went out and i got that entry-level corporate job and i spent the next dozen years sort of climbing the corporate ladder. And by age 30, I had achieved everything I ever wanted. The six-figure salary, luxury cars, big house in the suburbs with more toilets than people. I really had all the stuff, right? Uh, And uh, all the stuff that you would consider to be the American dream. More, more, more. Closets full of uh, designer clothes and all the nicest furniture and the status and the job title. And yet, as you mentioned, it wasn't making me happy. In fact, the closer I got to the pinnacle of success, the seemed the further away from happiness I got, mm-hmm. which didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And then two things happened to me. My mother died. My marriage ended both in the same month. And we talked about those in the, the last documentary on Netflix. And, and really, those two events forced me to look around and, and start to question everything in my life, not just the the stuff, but the career and the relationships and all of these other types of clutter that I began to uncover. But it seems to me, though, when you reinvented yourself, and we're going to get to that part, you were kind of at bottom. You had, like you said, you lost your marriage, you lost your mom. Is, is it easier to reinvent? Like, where do you get the balls to do this? Is it easier to do that when you're at the bottom than, you know, as opposed if you were, I don't know, happy enough in life? Yeah. Yeah. In a weird way, I think it's simultaneously easier and more difficult. And I'll try to explain that. Yeah. I think it's easier in the sense that like if you've lost a lot of the comfort and the certainty that you have in life, now all of a sudden you are uh, willing to make a change because you're experiencing enough pain that leads to a change. Mm -hmm. The obverse of that was my successful corporate life. It was never 10 out of 10 awesome. It was uh, constantly between a... uh, four and a five on a one to 10 scale. Mm-hmm. It was just comfortable enough to not make a change, right. but not comfortable enough or not uncomfortable enough maybe to have any sort of meaningful experiences. And so there was a weird level of perpetual anxiety and discomfort that undergirded all of it. But at the same time, it wasn't enough pain to make a significant change. So why was it easier? Well, because 
once you have enough pain, you start questioning everything. Why have I been so discontented? Why have I given so much material uh, meaning to all these material possessions? Who's the person I want to become? Because I don't like the person I have become so far. And how am I going to redefine success? Because this level of success, the so-called success that I've achieved, if I'm miserable, is it really success? Well, success with misery, that seems like failure to me. But what was the what was the final moment that you said, screw it, I'm quitting my job and I'm trying something else now? When I got closer and closer to the executives I wanted to be like, I had this whole mm -hmm. career mapped out that by age uh, 32, I'm going to be a vice president. By age 35, I'm going to be a, a senior VP. By age 40, I'm going to be a C-level executive, ideally a COO of this corporation that I'd worked for since I was 18. And and I'd climbed the corporate ladder. I was the youngest director in my company's 140-year history. I wow. was responsible for 150 retail stores, which I know with the whole minimalism thing is really ironic. Yeah. But I climbed the ladder. I got closer to these guys who I really aspired to be like. And I realized, like, well, wait a minute. As I got closer to them, the illusion, the mirage began, began to sort of dissipate. And I saw them for what they were. They weren't evil or bad guys, but... I had a ball, one boss who was on his third divorce and second heart attack, and he was 50 years old. I'm 42 now, right. and I realized, like, well, wait a minute. If I work really hard for the next 20 years, I can be just as miserable as these guys that I aspire to be like. But, of course, what do we tell ourselves? We say, ah, oh, I'm going to be different. How am I going to be different if I follow the same exact recipe that all of these other guys are? And right. by the way, I've been following their recipe. If I continue to follow that recipe, I'm going to bake the same cake. And it became easy when I realized like the fear of staying was actually more crippling than the fear of walking away. But did you bounce this off anybody? Hey, listen, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to, and then, and, and to do what, what was your, what was your plan? Right. I was just going to write. I mean, my, my honest plan at the time was uh, we had started the minimalists.com. I was making no money from it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I was going to work. Uh, I pared down my bills to literally next to nothing. I mean, mm -hmm. I when I walked away from the corporate world eventually in 2011, I made twenty three thousand dollars that first year. So I took a ninety percent pay cut. Yeah. Strangely, I was more financially free that year than I had been the last decade. It was what? the least amount of money I made in my entire adult life, uh -huh. but I was more free that year because I got rid of all of those expenses. I used to tell myself I need these things, or but the truth is there were things I wanted. But you know what I wanted more than that? I wanted freedom. And so you asked, did I talk to other people about it? Yeah. Heck yeah, I did it first. I learned what a mistake that was. Really? Because, yeah, because what happens is, oh, I'm going to leave and I'm just going to be a writer. And right. I had one boss that I had at the time said, well, if anyone could just quit their job and become a writer, then everyone would do it. And I <laughs> looked at him and I said, well, I don't think everyone wants to do that first off. But uh, second off, you're acting like I'm the first person in the history of the world who's decided to become a writer. And my plan was I'm going to work in this coffee shop in my local neighborhood, uh, make enough just to pay my rent. I was living in Dayton, Ohio. My expenses were really, really low. Mm -hmm. I got, I spent two years paying off all of my debt because I knew I, as long as I was tethered to debt, I was going to be tethered to this job, which means I was tethered to this lifestyle. And in a weird way, I was financing a car that would take me to work so I could pay the car payment for the car that would take me to work. And I needed to get rid of all of those things that I wanted, but weren't serving my freedom. I had to let go of those things so I could embrace the life I actually wanted to live. But was there any moment where you, you're even saying to yourself, I don't know, I think I'm kidding myself. Like you had to have been checking yourself with doubt, even while you were convinced I'm, I'm going for it. Right. Yeah. Now maybe I have an irrational confidence in, uh -huh. in a way. Um, I never thought all the things that happened would happen. And, and we took a rather circuitous route. I didn't even, I didn't like have like a 10 year plan or anything like that. My, my confidence was like, man, I think I can make enough money to pay my rent working at a coffee shop. And then I can just write in my other hours. And, and that's all I wanted. I found out what enough was for me because right. all those other things, they weren't doing it for me anymore. Right. I thought like, if I just get the Lexus, then I'll be happy. I got the Lexus. Well, maybe the second Lexus will make me happy. That didn't do it. Well, maybe the Range Rover will make me happy. Wow. Oh, that didn't do it either. Okay. And by the way, I didn't own any of those things. I didn't own the big house I had. These things were all finance. I made really good money, but I spent even more money. So I had tremendous amounts of debt, about half a million dollars worth of debt. Wow. And um, 
uh, I, I had to get rid of all of it in order to untether from that. And I realized like those things never got me to enough. Enough is not about getting more in our society. It's actually about subtracting. And I knew I needed to subtract the things to get me down to enough. I already had enough peace, enough happiness, enough joy. Those things were simply covered up by all these external pursuits. So I can understand Alexa's not making you happy, but a Range Rover, that surprises me. Now, <laughs> now what kind of writing were you were you trying to do or were you doing that? Yeah, it was just fiction. I, I was really into to fiction at the time. I thought that's all I was going to do. The The Minimalist was a side project. Uh-huh. My best friend, Ryan, he, he and I, we grew up together. We grew up really poor. We've known each other since we were fat little fifth graders. Yeah. And um and we climbed the corporate ladder together as well. And he actually came to me about eight months into my letting go, my simplifying. We were still both working in the corporate world together. And he came to me one day and he said, why the hell are you so happy? And I didn't even go around saying, look at me, I'm a minimalist now. I got rid of my stuff. I didn't say anything to anyone. I just started letting go of extra clothes that were in my closet or things that were getting in the way that weren't serving me, junk that was non-essential yeah. and and uh, clutter, basically. And I noticed that those material possessions were, were, and I didn't know this at the time, but they were this physical manifestation of what was going on inside of me. And as I started letting go of this external clutter, I started clearing out some of this internal clutter, the uh, relationship clutter, the mental clutter, the psychological clutter, the emotional clutter, the calendar clutter in my life. There was all these other types of clutter that I was not prepared for, didn't even know that I was clinging on to. And then when Ryan comes to me, he says, why the hell are you so happy? It opened up this door for me to talk about this simplifying I had been doing. And so he started simplifying as well. And he's way more type A than I am. And he's like, that's great. You've spent almost a year doing this. I need to do this like right now. And so we came up with this crazy idea called a packing party, which we made a film version of uh, for our last film, uh, Less Is Now. And ultimately, that was the beginning of the minimalists.com. We were just going to write about that 21 day journey. And it was going to be a place for me to publish a few essays that I wanted to write about, but I just wanted to write fiction. And then what I realized is like, Oh, wait a minute. A lot of people are finding value in these words. Mm -hmm. I remember the very first month we started the minimalists.com 52 people. They visited the website, which sounds really unremarkable now. But at the time, I was so impressed by it because you got to think throughout my 20s, I wrote fiction. And the only people who were reading my stuff were agents and publishers who were sending me rejection letters. Yeah, I had an inch thick stack of rejection letters of people telling me no. Now, unbeknownst to me, a lot of the stuff was actually kind of garbage at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's yeah. any writer that realizes that the stuff that seems so precious and like gold, everything that comes off of my quill must be perfect. No, it was nonsense, but it it made me the writer that I am today. And so I started writing at the minimalists.com and I realized once 52 people turned into 500 people and then it turned into four or 5 million people over the years, what I realized was that, oh, when someone gets value from something, they tend to share it with their friends and their family and their loved ones. Adding value, sharing value is a basic mm-hmm. human instinct. And this is before the uh, TikTok and, and Instagram and all these great ways to share these different things. People were actually forwarding their our blog to their sister or their aunt or their uncle or whomever it might be in their family, just sending it off to them an email or a text message. Right. And it just really began to spread word of mouth. And I said, oh, maybe we actually have something here. Let's Let's keep trying this out. Right. So you went, it's so interesting because people often complain today, it's so hard to go viral. You went viral before there was viral, you know, <laughs> so it's like, well, because you had interesting things to say and that, that gets shared. It's like, stop me. You know, people say, well, it's so hard. Well, yeah, it's even harder when there's no such thing as viral. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I don't even know that like we ever had anything until our Netflix film came out, which the first one is now on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And that thing has even taken off. It's it's gotten a third life now because we did a theatrical release around it. And uh, I could give you some really impressive stats around that. We had the number one uh, documentary in 2016 in theaters, which sounds really impressive to you realize like, when the hell have I seen a documentary in a theater? Like, <laughs> like no one goes to theaters to see documentaries, right? right. So like maybe 50,000 people saw it in, <laughs> in a theater, but, but now, you know, 50,000 people see it in an hour or whatever. And so, but before that, we never really had anything. And even now, like, we rarely have things that quote unquote go viral. I I think about when someone's playing baseball, the much more uh, 
impressive players on a long enough trajectory aren't the people that are hitting grand slams and home runs occasionally. Those are the viral moments. Mm -hmm. But we constantly had these singles or doubles. We were getting on base all the time. We were resonating with this core group of people. And there weren't things that you know, many, many mil tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people were seeing, but it was like, oh, wow, 100,000 people read that article. Oh, wow, 23,000 people uh, shared this one thing, whatever it might be. And, and it built from there. We didn't have anything that was just like, here's this huge viral moment. Mm -hmm. It was just these repeated things over and over. Oh, this resonated. Let me send this to my sister because I think it will resonate with her too. But how did you go from the moment? Like, how did you literally go from a very popular blog to... Mm -hmm. Getting a, a, a doc, documentary on Netflix. What was that? What was that step? Yeah, I over the over the years, I became what I call vehicle agnostic. Like mm -hmm. I remember when we first started the blog, Ryan came to me, I, to, to me with the idea. We didn't even have the name for it. He was like, "Hey, do you want to?" We didn't even know it was called a blog at the time. Do you want to start a website so we can share some of this story with other people? And I said, "Sure, we'll write a few things and we'll get that out there. It'll be great. It'll be a, a, a nice way for me to sort of." try my writing chops uh, online. I've never done that before because all I really wanted to do was write books, specifically novels. I just wanted to write fiction and I was rather married to that formula, that that genre, that format, that vehicle to communicate my writing. Mm -hmm. And then I started realizing like, oh, that's one way to do it. But some people find value in the blog and then other people find value in a tweet. And mm -hmm. other people find value in, well, eventually we started the podcast, which is, has now been our main vehicle for communicating things. It's, it's even eclipsed what we've done with the blog in terms of listenership. And then other people, they might get value from a YouTube video. And some people will get value from a long form documentary or a book. And so I've become vehicle agnostic. It's meeting people where they are as opposed to dragging them toward, nope, if you want to read about this, you have to read a 300 page book between bound covers. Right. No, it's meeting them where they are. We, we actually do a lot more audio books than we do um print books now because that is one way that people prefer to consume those materials. I prefer reading a physical book personally, right. but I'm not going to prescribe that to anyone else. But then how did it, but so, okay. So how did it become, how did you wind up selling it to Netflix though? Yeah. Great question. So we, <laughs> um, we were in 2014. Our second book came out on January 1st, 2014. It was called Everything That Remains. Mm -hmm. Ryan and I moved to this cabin in the middle of nowhere, uh, literally in the middle of nowhere. There was one traffic light in 3,400 square miles. And it's sort of that romantic vision. You think we're in Montana, right? It's like, oh, wow. I say romantic, not, not like uh, sexual romance, but like romance in the sense like, oh, this little writer moves to the cabin. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, when you're in Montana in winter, and oh. it's negative 26 degrees yeah. and it's blizzarding in October, you realize like all you really have to do is quite literally chop wood for the fireplace that kept us warm mm -hmm. and write. And we wrote the second book called Everything That Remains. It was the story of these two suit and tie corporate guys who walk away from the corporate world, become minimalists. It was our, our journey. And uh, we went on book tour that year with it. Now, Again, that sounds like a really romantic vision. Book tour for us was like we set up the book tour ourselves and we did 100 cities in eight countries, 119 events, 10 wait, months of our lives. Was, I have to interrupt because there's so much good stuff here. Yeah. You said so this was traditionally, your book was traditionally published or was it indie published? It was independently published. Uh, but we started, it's a long story, but we started our own publishing company. We had a handful of employees there as well. Um, and then it was, traditionally published overseas. So we, uh, we we did a sort of hybrid model of it, not uh, self-published, but um, independently published and then picked up by other publishers. Right. Okay. The so then you set up this book tour yourself, like all this work. So I, cause I have to point this out. Some people think, Oh, you see the publisher made it happen. No, 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 no. No one made any of this happen except you two guys. Yeah. Because you wanted it to happen. So tell me, so then you, how did this book tour come about? Well, thankfully we had some experience in the business world. We knew how to run a business. We started our own business with a, a third person named uh, Colin Wright, who's a prolific author by age 30. I think he had written 32 books and independently published quite a few of them and gone the traditional route with some other things and had some things optioned by Hollywood. And we realized like we had to come up with this formula. Oh, you know what? It's possible to do independent publishing mm -hmm. Uh, which is different from a big 
traditional publisher. And it's also different from vanity publishing or Mm self-publishing. I kind of liken it to indie music. You have big acts uh, who are huge mega stars, the Taylor Swifts and the Miley Cyruses of the world. And they thrive in that giant um, recording industry system. And then you have people who just are garage bands and they have fun jamming in their garage. That's sort of self-publishing. Right. But there's in music, there's this whole other world of independent publishing or independent music and ind- independent artists, especially now with the things have gotten so easy. But even since the 80s and 90s, you've had independent artists who don't fall into the big label system, but aren't just garage bands, aren't just jamming. They actually make a living. And right. we said, what if we model ourselves after independent musicians, people who are able to fill a 200 cap room, they can't fill up an arena or whatever. What if we did that, but we did it with book publishing. And eventually with that publishing company, we we ended up signing nine different authors and showed them how to fail with us and took mm-hmm. some of them out on tours. We did our own version of, of independent publishing for those authors, poets and fiction writers, nonfiction, you know, self-help, all, all of that. And we learned a lot along the way. So when we booked our own tour, it was literally us and a few employees and interns that we had there in Montana. We eventually moved our operations to the big city of Missoula, Montana, 70,000 people there. There's a writing school there at the University of Montana. In fact, our office was at the university. Uh, they had a, a, a startup incubator there. And so we decided, hey, we're going to go on this book tour. We had been on a few before, smaller ones, but we want to do it right. We really believed in this book. We believed in this message. So what we did is we set up 100 different uh, cities, 119 events, mm-hmm. and the message really began spreading. We did 400 media interviews that year, traditional media and non-traditional media, but everything from we'd be on the morning news at 5.20 a.m. in Albuquerque. Now, I don't know, maybe 14 people are watching that, but it allowed us to really to develop our um, our interviewing chops and it allowed us to see what resonates with with different people while we go out on these tour stops. Now, it wasn't sexy. Our business plan that year was if we sell enough books tonight, we mm-hmm. can stay in a hotel. If we don't, we're going to sleep in Ryan's Toyota Corolla. Right. And then occasionally, sometimes listeners or not, they weren't listeners at the time. They were audience members, viewers, readers. They um, they would let us stay at their spare bedroom or in their guest house. Or sometimes we'd just sleep on the floor. Or we'd sleep at rest stops, Wh- whatever made sense. And it was quite literally living in the moment. We're going uh, tonight. We're going to be in Des Moines. And then we have a tour stop tomorrow in Omaha. And eventually we work our way around to Halifax, Canada, and we're just driving around in Ryan's Toyota Corolla making that happen. And what I realized is that, yeah, early on, eight people would show up at a tour stop. But as the message began to continue, it it really it it increased exponentially. By the end of that tour, thousands of people were showing up at tour stops and we would have... Tell me about these tour stops, though. Was it, are you at indie bookstores or are you booking venues for yourself? Yeah, initially we, we booked indie bookstores. In fact, all 100 uh, cities, we did indie bookshops, except for like two or three cities that just don't have an indie bookstore at all anymore, which is uh-huh. really sad. Uh, Las Vegas is a good example of that. I think Dallas didn't have an indie bookshop at the time. That's actually been fixed recently. But um, what we did is we'd book these with indie bookstores. And then when the crowds became too large for those bookstores, then they would find a local theater or a local public yoga studio or uh, some open space that we could have these tour stops. We'd partner with these indie bookstores mm-hmm. and uh, and then they would help us with, you know, with the space and these tour stops. So who's paying for the space of the bookstores or you guys? Usually the bookstore would, they'd have some sort of arrangement with right. a local, like they'd have a theater across the street. I remember we showed up in Indianapolis and, um, 80 people RSVP'd for that event, which you never know because they're free events. Sometimes 80 people RSVP and maybe 40 people actually show right. up because it's right. free, right? We had 80 people RSVP and we knew the bookstore only held about 60 people. You could maybe cram an extra 20 in there, but we had 400 people show up at the Indianapolis book tour stop. And that's when I kind of knew like, oh, this is bigger than I thought it was ever going to be. And and they had to find, they had a local theater across the street that was abandoned but had recently been acquired by a friend of theirs and they just let us use it i mean we had no plan we were just kind of just showing up and Mm -hmm. figuring out what would happen holding court in a theater with no uh no no microphones no electricity we just found a way to to make it happen and 
And uh, it wasn't always pretty, but um, man, I, I think if we were trying to wait for everything to be perfect, we'd still be waiting. That's exactly right. Because it's not, this is what I'm always yelling at people. Stop asking for permission, put the energy in and then see, you know, you have to make it happen. Uh, that's what I find so inspiring by what, I mean, Jesus, I mean, you re, you literally reinvented yourself and none of it was easy, but you did it anyway. And now do you still go back on tour? Yeah, we've done 10 tours in the last 12 years, and they're appreciably different. The reason yeah. I brought that up is because while we were on the road, we didn't have any extra money to film a documentary, but we had our friend, Matt Diavella, who is huge now, has a huge YouTube channel, huge following, but at the mm -hmm. time, he was uh, just a young filmmaker who was looking to do something meaningful, and we he had reached out to us, and we started talking, and he was doing commercials at the time. In fact, he filmed the book trailer for that book I, I talked about. I was like, well, mm. we don't have a ton of money, but I can pay you. We're going to be doing a media event in New York. Why don't you come out, film that, and do a book trailer for everything that remains? And uh, so we paid him to do that. And uh, we said, hey, do you want to come on the road with us for a few weeks during this long tour that we're doing? And we'll set up some interviews along the way. And that way we don't have to fly to all these different cities. And so part of that tour about six to eight weeks of that tour was just Matt in the back of the Corolla with his all his gear and lighting set up. And while we'd go to a city, we'd say, oh, you know, there are these great people we want to interview in San Francisco, or there's someone in Los Angeles we want to interview, or, oh, we're going to be doing a tour stop in Salt Lake City. I know we want to talk to these two people while we're in Salt Lake City. Or we're going to be in Austin, Texas. Make sure we interview these people while we're there. We're going to be in Philadelphia. I know there's someone we want to talk to there. And so we just went around while we were in the city. We'd make time with any downtime we had to film some interviews. And at the end of it, Michael, I got to tell you, we had a thousand hours of footage because we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Right. We had a thousand hours of footage. Now, the docu first documentary, Minimalism, is 79 minutes long. And I remember at the end of that tour, we just kind of looked at Matt and said, OK, good luck with all the footage. Now, a lot of it, interviews we didn't use, a lot of it was like road footage and, and other things. And he pieced together something really special. We went through nine different iterations of that film. And uh, eventually we pitched it to Netflix and they were like, <laughs> not for us. And they were really the only streaming game at town at the time. This is back in 2015 when we were finishing up the film. There were a few other smaller services then that don't even exist anymore. But Netflix was pretty much the only game in town. So, But I've always been the, all right, that's fine. You don't want it. We'll put it out on our own. Mm -hmm. Let's do a theatrical release, which I would never, ever do again. It's crazy. And uh, we submitted the film festivals. We did a theatrical release, 400 theaters, U.S., Canada, Australia, and um, didn't get anyone's permission. We just right. figured out a way to do it. We, we found a distributor who was willing to work with us to get it into select theaters around the country. And um, so we it was wildly successful in theaters for a documentary. And so we went back to Netflix and we were like, hey, look how great it did. And they're like, yeah, you still not for us. Sorry. OK, no problem. Let's go ahead and put this online on our own transactional video on demand. Get it up on iTunes and Amazon and Vimeo. And we did that. And because we had already cultivated this audience through our mm -hmm. blog and eventually through the podcast, which we had just started to help promote the film. Ironically, the film ended up promoting the podcast way more than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. But we had built this audience. They sent it to number one on iTunes. And now uh, Netflix came back to us and they were like, yes. hey, you know that film that you came to us with? See, th this I just did a long that? talk about this a couple of days ago. You, when people are begging to get into Hollywood, and I go, if you want Hollywood to want you, you got to smell like money, which is what you guys did. You stunk of money, which is because you had created this thing, which people wanted. Now Netflix, that's how you sell something. Netflix comes to you. Yeah. Yeah. And, right. and they did. And, you know, it, what they did is ironically, they paid us less than we made from any other platform. So we made less money from Netflix, but they did something really great for us. They got us in, into so many more homes. Yeah. They got us into, in fact, they only did the U.S. rights initially or the English rights, but then it did so well for them on, on the platform. They they licensed the worldwide rights uh, for a three-year period. And they re-upped those rights for mm -hmm. another three years. So we spent about seven years on Netflix with that first film. And eventually, just this year, we got the rights back and we put it up on YouTube on our own. And millions of other people have seen it on YouTube now. But Netflix got us in front of about 80 million people. And so that changed right. everything. It brought a lot of people into the podcast. And it also made them want to work with us on a second film. So they 
worked with us on our second film, Less Is Now, and it became a Netflix original, which ended up getting nominated for an Emmy, which I thought was a joke. When I got the email, I had to like check the... The, I was like, oh, this must be some sort of spam nonsense, right? <laughs> um, and and what I realized is like, well, I wasn't pursuing any of these things specifically. It was just like, these things were a great byproduct. Right. Let's just sit down and create something that we really want to create. And, and hopefully everything else works out. But tell me about, so your friend Matt, when he, because I have so many questions here. When he, when he came along on the ride with you, was he mm-hmm. getting paid or was he doing this just to hustle himself to make his own projects happen? Yeah, more of the latter. We, I mean, we just said, hey, man, we want to make sure we give you a, uh, a disproportionately generous portion of this film mm-hmm. because I don't have money to pay you for this right, right now. And so you are also an owner of the film as the director. He was also the editor. That's actually his true talent. I mean, he's a phenomenal director, but right. he is a savant of an editor. And uh, yeah, so he just came along the road uh, on the road with us and, and owns a, a major chunk of the film as a result. Uh, had we just paid him, I mean, sure, he would own less. But what I like about this is making sure that we t- always take money off the table with any of these things. Anyone who works with the minimalists now, it's like, OK, I can't I'm, not, I'm probably not going to make you a millionaire. But what I'm going to do is provide a atmosphere for creative work that you will enjoy and find meaning in and also make sure you're compensated well enough for it that we you're not worried about money. And so. Right. Hey, this is the project we're going to work on together. We didn't know if anything was going to happen. Honestly, I didn't even know if it was going to be turned. When you have a thousand hours worth of footage, I don't even know if you can turn that into a a documentary. But um, if so, great. I mean, there's so many other projects we've started that that's the problem with the the iceberg. You see only what's above the water. But mm-hmm. we've worked on other films, we've worked on other books, we've worked on you know, blog posts, podcast episodes, whatever that never see the light of day. But that's yeah, that that's just the way things are. A lot of things hit the cutting room floor that aren't meant to be shown to the public. What had are you worried about running out of things to say? Because your message is, is simple. It's yeah. less is you know, the less you have, the more less fewer problems you have. But are you worried about okay, what do I say now? Yeah. What a thoughtful question. I, I think that's that's an important question too, because uh-huh. it's not about just continuing to regurgitate the 16 rules for living with less or or whatever, those things are helpful for people, but they're out there already. What I've learned is as I've uncovered that external clutter, I really found all of these other forms of clutter. So recently we've been talking a lot more about these other types of, of clutter that are creating dread or anxiety in our lives. Calendar clutter is a big one that comes up a lot. I didn't even realize how much calendar clutter I had because I was saying yes to all of these things. It sounded like good opportunities on their own. But when mm-hmm. I say yes to this and I say yes to this, I say yes to this, I inadvertently, after saying a thousand yeses, now I'm saying no to the things that are actually most important to me. Right. Everyone else's emergency is now becoming urgent for me. But just because something is urgent for you doesn't mean I have to take it on. I have to say yeah. yes to it. And uh, what I realized is that calendar clutter is a type of consumerism. It's thinking that if I just say yes to all the right things, then my life will be complete. But it ends up stressing us out. And it's become culturally acceptable. In fact, it's become praised, right? Mm. Oh, what are you up to lately? Oh, I'm just so busy. Look I, look how important I am. I'm so busy, right? right. But it's so course, interesting. That, Go on, please, I didn't interrupt you. Well, busy is just a, a four-letter word. It just means my life's out of control. Whenever yeah. I go around saying, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, it means I don't have control of my own life. It's, so what's interesting is you made this step, which is to forsake all these trappings to live, become minimalist. And as you became more successful, the trapping somehow uh, find a way to encroach back in. Absolutely. And you, and you have yeah, to it's, keep it's, checking that. Consumerism takes many forms, right? And for me, it was the material because uh, I thought that was going to make me happy mm-hmm. or whole or complete. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then you replace that with other things. Like I remember when we first became your quote unquote famous, like people started recognizing us in public. It wasn't about like, is this enough? It's like, how do I get more of this? Right. Uh-huh. It's like, but then you realize really quickly, it took me about six months. So maybe it wasn't that quick. It took me about six months to realize like, oh, this isn't why you're doing this, man. You're, if you're chasing happiness, you're never going to find it. You were chasing it over here with the, the Range Rover or the big house or whatever. You mm-hmm. didn't get it there. You're not going to get it from applause or veneration either. And right. what I realized over time is, you know what enough for me is? Is zero. 
I don't need the applause. I don't need the praise. Those things are nice. And I'm not allergic to them. And I'm, I'm not shunning them either. Anthony DeMello talks about as soon as you denounce a thing, you're forever tethered to it. And I, I find that to be true. I'm not denouncing material possessions. I own stuff. I'm talking to you in a microphone. I'm wearing a shirt. I'm wearing pants. I'm wearing shoes, whatever it is. I own some stuff. I don't denounce things, but I also don't need things to be whole or complete. I am complete in an empty room and I don't need material possessions. I don't need your praise. I don't need, um, I don't need a specific relationship in order to make me happy. I can have those things. I can enjoy those things, but as soon as I need them, that's the type of prism. You know, I mean, yeah, it's so, it's just so interesting because like, like, you know, you've gotten, you've created the success for yourself and yet it still has a way of sneaking back in and you have to constantly check it, you know? So it's a journey. It's now you're never there. Yeah. Yeah. I would say success doesn't exist um, because it's almost like this, it's a mirage, right? You see the successful person. I do this at some of our tour stops or live events sometimes. And I was asked the crowd, Shout out one thing that you associate with a sex- successful person. If I show you a picture of a successful person, what does that person look like? And it's almost always like an ad from a magazine almost. It's like it's a, a guy wearing a suit. So it's an expensive suit. There's some sort of expensive jewelry or watch. If it's a woman, she has a nice dress, a nice handbag. And uh, it's always the accoutrements of success. But it's not, never about the person's inner state. It's never like, oh, yeah, they're really at peace. Or mm-hmm. they don't really need for much. Now, you can redefine what success is, but culturally, when we talk about success, there's a portrait of success that we're identifying. And now it's so absurd. It's like, it's not just the nice suit. It has to be the Louis Vuitton shoes, or it has mm-hmm. to be the Gucci wallet, or it has to be the Balenciaga, whatever, right? And these become the markers of success, but they're just trinkets. And even those f- things, I'm not against necessarily, but they're not going to make you happy. Do you find yourself slipping into judgment, though, of people who have it? Yeah, I, I used to, yeah, because I would pathologize needing those things. But now I don't judge, I identify. Because that's just me, man. Like, I, I, yes, I want to be accepted, or at least I wanted to be accepted, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I thought that those things were a shortcut. And so if anything, I have empathy for my former self who thought that that was going to make people look, and here's the, the, the perverse thing about it. Let's say that buying the right car or the right wallet or the right belt or the right shoes or whatever does get you acceptance from a particular peer group. Well, man, you're being accepted for things that aren't even you. So are they accepting you or are they accepting the the status symbols? But let me get your help on something. Because I wrote a story about this called in my, my book where it's like when I walk by, we my wife and I go by, we, we take walks in these very expensive neighborhoods because it's pleasant to walk around in. Mm-hmm. And you look at a big house and you go like a big and you go, man, and my instinct is, yeah, but they're miserable. And she goes, you don't know that. <laughs> I go, well, they have to be. (laughs) Like, can 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 they? Do they do they have to be? Can't they be happy and have a big house and all that stuff? Tell me. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. It's unlikely. It's unlikely. Uh, Go on. Yeah, Yeah, it's unlikely because the the constant need for more does not stop. Right. When you get the big house, what do you want? I mean, I live up in Ojai, California, Uh and. A lot of people live there in their third home. Their third home right. is in Ojai. Yeah. I used to live in Missoula, Montana. And man, a lot of people have their second or third home in Missoula. And I'm not against that even, right? Mm. But when is it enough? When is what what amount of square footage is enough? Mm-hmm. Here's a question we never were stopped stopped to ask. How much money is enough? Right. Because more always sounds like it's better, which fine. If someone comes in here and hands me bags of money, I'm not going to object to that, right? Mm-hmm. But that's not how capitalism works. What happens with capitalism, and I'm not against capitalism either, but the ugly side of capitalism is now you're tethered to something. Mm-hmm. Someone shows up with a, a bag full of a million dollars. It's not no strings attached. There are definitely strings attached. Mm-hmm. And those strings are attached is taken away from my freedom. There's this uh, essay that was in the New York Times a few years ago called Power, No Thanks, I'm Good. And in that essay, they posit that the least free person in America is the president of the United States. Right. The most powerful person in America is the least free person. Well, why is that? 
It's because to have dominion over everyone comes with a whole lot of strings. You're tethered to obligations. And by untethering from obligations, you may not be able to have the big house, but you might have something that you want a whole lot more, some tranquility, some peace, some equanimity. Right. I just wonder, does that take convincing of your stick? Do you have to convince yourself of that or you just go, no, I'm in, I'm in. No, I think you just have to see it. You have to see Um, it. Yeah, because I don't think any level of convincing ever works. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, I think it was Dale Carnegie who said, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I love that because, yeah, you can convince me that you know who, Michael Jordan's the greatest basketball player of all time but if I don't actually believe that mm-hmm. I'm going to go back to my defaults Kapil Gupta says everyone defaults to their defaults right and and so yeah you can convince me for a period of time but unless I actually see it and that's what happened when I walked away from the corporate world I actually saw it it wasn't mm-hmm. just uh, this hypothetical or cerebral exercise it was feeling it viscerally and then you don't need any convincing no level of convincing is required that's what love is by the way to love Mm -hmm. someone is to see them for who they are without trying to convince them of your love without trying to manipulate them or coerce them actually seeing them and i think that's true with our material possessions with our calendar with that big house that you see in beverly hills or wherever you know what yes you see it for what it is You see the tethers that are attached to it. And if you want those tethers, fine. But if you don't want what is attached to those tethers, realize that you don't actually want the house either. Hey, it's Michael Jammin. If you like my content, and I know you do because you're listening to me, I will email it to you for free. Just join my watch list. Every Friday, I send out my top three videos of the week. These are for writers, actors, creative types, people like you. You can unsubscribe whenever you want. I'm not going to spam you. And the price is free. You got no excuse. To join, go to michaeljammin.com slash watchlist. And now back to what the hell is Michael Jammin talking about? See, to me, what you're saying is you literally, literally, I don't know, you you took a leap. You took a leap of faith. I believe Mm -hmm. that this is not going to make me happy. And I believe this will make me happy. And and you're someone who continues to make leaps. Uh, This is a little bit of a segue here, but you took a leap from being you know, management into yeah. a writer, into a performer. Now you're on stage. You're pre- you're pre- like, where do you get the balls to say that I'm a performer now? You know what I'm saying? You, you, <laughs> it's a leap. Yeah. I don't ever think of it that way. I guess I, um, I just started doing these events because I was happy that it, I remember once we did a tour stop in Knoxville mm-hmm. in 2011, it was our first book, which is called minimalism. And, um, no one showed up. And we're at this little bookstore slash cafe. Uh So Ryan and I are just there. It's a random (laughs) Thursday night. And we're drinking coffee, waiting on it. Is anyone going to show up? And uh, (laughs) and no one showed up. And it's like, you know, we'll give it 10 more minutes. We start walking out. It's half hour into the event. Uh And we're walking out. And as we're walking out, there's this guy who and his girlfriend who are walking in. They say, hey, you're the minimalists. And I'm uh, like, yes, yes, we are. And they're we like, we don't oh, even have here. an audience. That's how minimal we are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and they're like, we're here to see you. I'm like, that's great. You're the only people who showed up. Uh-huh. <laughs> and well, so let's sit down, pull up a chair. Let's have a conversation. So we had a tour stop with two people show up. Right. And um, to me, that was one of the most meaningful experiences we've had. I didn't look at it as a performer. I've kind of been like water. Like I, we just fit the 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 vessel that we're in and if two people show up we'll have a great two-person conversation but if surely you must people think, show up we'll have a different conversation but don't you but you must have some kind of pressure to feel like i have to entertain here mm. not just educate but entertain no i enjoy entertaining yeah i i don't know that i that i have to that would feel like that would also feel like a prison but i, I enjoy mm-hmm. entertainment like i like shows that are actually shows right like um conversations are cool but i i really like the I, I like the when people put the effort and get really obsessed about something, whether mm-hmm. it's set design or it is audio mm-hmm. or it is the way the words look on a page and the typesetting, whatever it is, I really appreciate the obsession. And yeah, I do like entertainment. Um, I don't know that's the point of doing what I do, but I, I don't think that it hurts. I mean, it's 
to be entertaining in a way is to be courteous to an audience because no right. one goes to the beach with a calculus textbook and says like, oh, I'm really looking forward to diving because there's no entertainment there at all. Right. It's it's not delightful. And right. so I, I do enjoy delighting an audience. And I think it makes it what we're talking about a lot, uh, a lot more compelling. But was there a moment there had to be a, like of imposter syndrome? Who am I to be standing here? Who am I to be writing this book? Who might be, you know, was there ever that? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that I never felt like an imposter. I just always felt like I was exploring. You're exploring. Um, yeah, because I'm not prescribing anything to anyone. Anytime I do, then I'll start to feel like an imposter. Uh -huh. uh, isn't here are the three things that you should do to be happy. In fact, I don't even, happiness doesn't even work like that. There's nothing you can do to be happy. Happiness can't be acquired. It can't be attained. It, it, it is already there. It's pre-existing. We never go to a baby and say, well, here are three things you should do to be happy. You just mm -hmm. see him smile and coo and laugh. And it's like, oh, well, why can't I do that? Well, it's because I've covered it up with all the damn prescriptions, right? And so I'm not prescribing anything. Anytime I do, then yeah, I start to feel like an imposter because right. who, who knows what, but I, I, people often call into our podcast and they'll say, uh, do you have any advice about this? And the first thing I always say is I don't have any advice, but I have some observations. Mm-hmm. Because right. I can't tell you what to do, but I, I can tell you what I see. Right. So it's really just about you maintaining your authenticity and speaking what your truth is and take it or leave it. It's some whatever someone else's truth is that's that's for them to decide. Yeah. If I see a truth, I, I can I can observe it. I can put yeah. it out there on the table and whether or not someone else picks it up, that's that's up to them. By the way, my beliefs don't really matter at all anyway. Like my beliefs don't matter. The listeners beliefs don't matter. The truth is the only thing that does matter. Mm -hmm. I was just talking to someone earlier today about this. If if uh, if I told you I believe the earth is flat, does that matter? Does it change anything? Right. No, but but I think the obverse of that also doesn't change. What if I tell you I believe the earth is round? Well, so what? Congratulations. Right. The, the earth is round regardless of whether or not I believe it. And uh, no amount of belief or clinging to a belief or changing a belief or convincing someone else that my belief is right is going to change what the truth is. Right. Now, I this is I'm, I'm jumping a little bit, but. I feel like part of what your journey was, I wonder, I don't know, I wonder, was it made a lot easier because you went on it with your best friend? It seems to mm. me like, I'm not sure if I could do this alone. Yeah. In some ways it was easier, but a lot of times it was way harder because he Why? and I are so different people. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, we're like exact opposites in many ways. Um, I'm super introverted. He's super extrovert. Like he's the most extroverted person I know. I'm the most introverted person. I know. So if you look at us on like a Myers Briggs personality test, yeah, I am an ISTJ. He is an ENFP. We're literally exact opposite person. Excuse me, exact opposite personalities. Mm -hmm. But when we interact with each other, we're both mentors and mentees to each mm -hmm. other. And I found that that was really helpful to have someone there to help maybe keep me accountable. But other times it was, oh man, it's hard to not want to change this person to pick up my beliefs. And then what happens is we start battering each other with our own beliefs or our own opinions and it, it, everything we've moralized everything, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you, you like cappuccinos more than lattes. Clearly you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. That's a preference. Um, and so um, it was harder, but it also allowed me to let go of a lot of that belief clutter that I was holding on to. Belief clutter. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, th that's really what, that's what I picked up from your last special. It's not just about letting go of stuff. It's about letting go of preconceived notions. It's about letting go of, uh, yeah. I mean, that's what I found so inspiring by, by what you guys are doing, but I, I don't know. It seems to me like, cause you, sh you still have a business here. You have a creative business. You've reinvented themselves as creative people and you're going on it. You're, I don't know. At the end of the day, you still got to pay the bills. You, you're taking a big risk, you know? So to me, it feels like does does having that partner there put you at ease a little bit yeah I, I i mean the weird thing is i still make less money than i did in the corporate world um and in fact i even took a pay cut this year to make sure that everyone is uh -huh. uh, being paid uh well and um i'm totally fine with that there are a lot of things i could do that i don't want to do i mean like we don't do ads on our podcast for example you don't uh, do ads on your podcast no i just i don't like them i i um I like going to museums and I can only imagine like if I went to mm -hmm. the LACMA and I went to the Picasso room and all of a sudden they were painting McDonald's arches onto his paintings, I wouldn't feel as good about the art. 
It's um, funny because I don't do I don't monetize either. But to me, it's really more, it's about something. To, what what's your end, the end goal then? How do you you know what's the monetization process to promote your other projects? Yeah, I mean that, that's part of it. I just enjoy doing it. We we didn't monetize the podcast at all for years, uh-huh. um, and now we just support it on Patreon. So we do a private version okay. of the podcast for patrons who want to support us. But right. uh, frankly, you know that's a, a very small sliver of the audience. Everything else we do for free, completely yeah. ad free. We don't monetize our YouTube channel. I just don't like advertisers, and, and that's not a moral stance, and it's not a judgment on anyone else. It's just a, a personal preference. I to me. You know, there's some people who just really don't like cilantro, yeah. and uh, I'm not going to convince them that they should like cilantro mm-hmm. just, or that all oh, you're morally wrong because you dislike cilantro. It's it's kind of gross to them, and I, and po- advertisements on my podcast are just kind of gross to me. And I understand and, that, but it seems to me like it, it almost like yeah, you're you're by minimalism, and then someone puts an ad to buy sneakers that you don't eat or whatever. I could see the the disconnect. But also you're entitled to have a business and you're entitled to make a living and what you offer has value. I mean, you yeah, know, I don't I don't think I'm entitled to anything, um, but I, I, I can do any of those. There are no shoulds. There are endless possibilities, endless uh-huh. coulds. Right. So right. I could do ads. Right. Uh, there are a bunch of things I could do, um, but I just choose not to because I'd, I'd rather not. And right. And um, I, to me, like I would rather just go work at a coffee shop than put ads on. I'll do the podcast for free and just go work at a coffee shop than put ads on. We have enough listeners that I could make seven figures a year from putting ads on the thing. So uh-huh. uh, put my preferences where, where my mouth is. And again, this is not a moral stance and it's not uh, me standing on a pedestal. I just simply dislike ads and I'm not willing to say yes to something that grosses me out. Yeah, well, good for you. I definitely who can't respect that. But what is it then? What is it then that gives you joy? What is it that you're working towards? Like, what are your other ambitions with the minimalist? You know, minimalist. What do you want to do? Yeah, I don't. I don't look at success. If I do look at success at all, I don't look at it as a, as the sort of the big accomplishments. Like those things can be fun as a byproduct. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's you know being a, a best selling author or being nominated for an Emmy or whatever it might be. I don't shoot for those things. I try to map out my life to see what I want to do on a random Wednesday. Like, what do you want your average Wednesday to look like? Okay. What is is your, what do you want your average Wednesday to look like? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, usually I want to, I want to get up. I want to exercise. I want to read. I want to write those three (laughs) things. I do Mm -hmm. first thing in the morning. I really enjoy those, those things. Um, I'll get some sun. I'll go for a hike. I'll I'll do some grounding. I might have a conversation like this or two. Uh I, I limit the conversations that I have just because um, I don't want to keep saying yes to a bunch of things. Because if I'm saying yes to this, right. I want to be present with you. This is a hell yes for me. We're having this conversation right now. Why distract myself with something else I have going on this afternoon or tomorrow or whatever? My point is that if you solve for Wednesday, you aren't, there's nothing grandiose. I don't want, yeah. What do you want your average Wednesday to look like? Oh, well, I want to you know, win an Oscar and I want right. to uh, become you know, a, a number one New York Times bestselling author, whatever it is. Like those things can happen, but that's not going to happen your average Wednesday. What, so what if it's I'm taking my my daughter to she doesn't go to she we homeschool her, but we take her to like this co-op. And so like what if I spend an hour reading to my daughter? What do, what do I want my average Wednesday to look like? is appreciably different from the giant peaks that we often see on the the success roadmap it's so i mean you're so grounded you use the word yourself you know grounding exercise and yeah i mean it's just i i I just have so much first of all i'm honored that i'm that i get this conversation because i i i don't know i just think it's so interesting to hear you're a very successful person you i think you're successful I think you assess, you can be measured as a successful person in many different ways, but obviously the most important one is your happiness quotient and, and what gives you peace and joy, you know? Yeah. And if I, if I find myself chasing it, then I know that I'm, I've been misled or I've misled myself really. Right. Um, Cause the happiness is out there. The joy is not out there. The, the, everything else that we seek is already here and it's almost it's like a spiritual current. journey you put yourself oh, on. oh absolutely yeah, yeah yeah it's it's really just identifying what enough is and letting go of anything that gets in the way of enough yeah what yeah that's so interesting now do you also though now that you have a child do you have do you do you worry i mean i don't know do you also worry about that do you worry for her no 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 I, 
<laughs> no, I mean, it, because I know that she's going to go just last week. This is timely, but uh, her boyfriend, uh, I mean, the boy she holds hands with occasionally, right. she's 10 years old. Okay. Um, yeah. And he called to break up with her and he asked her, uh, can we, can we just be friends? Now, this is her first boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I didn't want to correct her and be like, right. hey, Ella, you know what? You were just you were friends. Just friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd have a big problem if you weren't just friends at age yeah. 10. Um, but anyway, yeah. And so she's going through all this heartache. And right. um, instead of pathologizing it and saying, don't cry. Uh-huh. Yeah, I felt the heartache for her as well. But real joy, real peace makes room for that. Yeah. Uh, I could still be at peace at it and experience those so-called negative emotions. I can feel the sadness for her. And she looks up at me and she says, I'm so sad. And I don't even know why I'm sad. Why am I sad? And uh, oh, my heart was just broken. And then instead of me preaching to her, she asked a question. And that mm-hmm. opened up the door for conversation. And I was able yeah. to explain to her, well, we get sad or we get upset. We get angry, we get frustrated. Whenever our expectations of the world, our worldview doesn't map onto reality. And right now you want things to be one way and they are another way. And being sad isn't wrong or bad. You're going to experience this. And by the way, by her experiencing it, that's how she moves on from it. She moved on so much quicker than I would have. And that's what the beautiful thing about kids. Yeah, when you have a kid, you learn so much about letting go. Uh, th- th- she has far less to learn from me than I have to learn from her. But but okay, you, I mean, I, you sound very obviously very zen and very uh, at balance. But when you were starting this minimalism journey to get your th- the word out there to do these shows and you know book tours and all, there must have been disappointments along the way. Right. And, and, and would frustrated the hell out of you or no? <laughs> All the disappointments happened later, uh, uh, way after the success. Like what? Really? Absolutely, man. Like it was all just a beautiful accident early on. I remember the first time we had an amazing tour stop where it was, was 2012, December, 2012. Uh, we, this was our second tour. Yeah. Um, we called the holiday happiness tour. We did 10 cities over the course of maybe, uh, three weeks mm-hmm. and uh, U.S. and Canada, just 10 major markets. And we had people actually show up to these. Like, I remember we had 70 people show up in San Francisco and we had uh, maybe 25 people show up in uh, Washington, D.C. and 40 people in Boston. And like all of a sudden we had people who were actually showing up to these things. And then we had this event in Toronto. It was at this uh, co-working space that we had. They had let us, someone found it for us. They let us use it for free. And we show up. And um, it was the first time I absolutely knew that, oh, our lives are going to be different after this. Because mm-hmm. um, we showed up and there was another event going on. It totally blocked off our event. And this other event that was going on there, there was uh, all these people waiting to get in. I'm like, oh, they're totally going to screw up the small event that we have planned. And so I look at the organizer. Her name was Melissa. I said, Melissa, um, what event are they here for? And she looked at me and she said, they're for you, dummy. Wow. And it was like a thousand people who showed up at this event. And this space was big enough to accommodate it? No, not at all. <laughs> and uh, we, they, we, they actually let us use the basement. And even then, there were people who, I mean, it was like sardines at a rock concert or something. Mm-hmm. And it was all gravy, man. Like, I would have been... I would have been just as thrilled if 15 people showed up that night. Right. And it's easy to say as a, a Monday morning quarterback... But what happened is that started to build up these expectations in the future. Like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, now, now we need 2,000 people to show, whatever it is. And it's like, well, no. In fact, recently, we just started doing these smaller events uh, here in Los Angeles. We did five of them over the course of, uh, I don't know, six months or so. We called them Sunday Symposiums. Uh-huh. And we, we made them intentionally small, it, where only 200 people could show up. It was a 200-seat theater downtown, and that was it. If you... Showed up for that, great. And every single one of them sold out. Because let's do something intentionally small. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to do some events with 12 people. Because to me, having the expectation totally ruins the thing. Whoever shows up, shows up. If I need them to start showing up. Oh, man. Uh, That's what's so, going to happen? Right. So uh, so that, so that it was once you hit that success, like you're saying, the expectation. That, that's when you have disappointment 
more expectations. So were there others? Man, this is just so interesting to me. So what do you do then other than keep yourself in check? Because your natural inclination is to do get more, more success, more, more followers, more fans and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was about identifying what enough is. But yeah, there'll be some disappointments along the way. Like there was this film series we were working on. Uh, Netflix actually encouraged it. And mm-hmm. so I go to pitch them on it. I do all my own pitching. I don't have an agent do it. I just show up and I'll have them book the appointment. It's just me in a room with whatever executives. And that, that's how it's worked. And then I show up and best pitch of my life. It went amazing. It was this project, a six part series, and it could not have gone better. The only way it could have gone better is they bought it in the room, which happens right. from time to time. Um, it's a great. We'll get back to you next week. This is a Friday. And on Monday, my agent calls me, and this is a few years ago, and it was right when Netflix stock tanked. And he he called me and he said, "Hey, um, they let go of like seventy five percent of that team that you pitched." <laughs> 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 and so you got to put this on hold for a while. And so that's what I've done. I set it on the shelf, and mm-hmm. it's unfortunate because I've spent more money on that project and and more time on that than I'd I'd care to admit. But Mm -hmm. the real reward is an action. And this sounds like a cliche, but in doing the work and if it gets out there, great. If not, I got to enjoy the process uh, of it. Um, It only becomes a punishment when I need a particular outcome. And as soon as I need that outcome, man, then it doesn't make room for any spontaneity. Imagine like if you are in New York city and you, uh, you need to drive to LA but then what if halfway there, some amazing opportunity happens in Seattle right. or in Bismarck, North Dakota? You're not allowed to do it now because I have to be in Los Angeles. But if I'm in New York and I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to drive west and see what happens. And that's really what this journey has been for us. Like, let's just kind of go that direction and see what happens. Yeah, we might end up in L.A., but we also might end up in Fargo. And that's OK, too. But given that your history is these guys of like bootstrapping everything why not just do this project yourself why yeah yeah and i I think we probably will it's just it'll change the dynamics of it um Uh uh, we needed some money to to do the 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 big theatrical delightful entertaining things that we were going to do right um and so that that's great and we'll probably end up doing the project on our own anyway it'll just change the the way that it looks and i'm totally fine with that i'm not married to a particular mold. I'm always willing to let go of this so I can pick that up. Yeah. Wow. See that. Yeah. That's kind of, I say that as well. That success doesn't, doesn't really look like what you think it looks like. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting that, yeah, there's the, your, your pitch stories for Netflix. That's so, I don't know. I, I, this has been such a, I don't know. I feel like this has been a good interview just for me to hear, just for me to hear, like <laughs> I need to convince myself of this stuff. And by the way, I've thrown it. Like I went on a purge, getting rid of stuff as well. But I always wonder, sh- shouldn't I throw out more? Isn't there more I can get rid of? W- what do you do when you have to bring stuff? What do you do? I don't know. W- how do you decide what you're going to bring into your home? Yeah, that is a simple question I asked. Uh, will this add value to my life? And I think we can only determine that truly uh, if we've deprived ourselves for a period of time. I'm not a deprivationist. I'm not an mm-hmm. ascetic. I don't live like a monk in a monastery. I certainly don't live like an ascetic in a cave. But I will temporarily remove things from my life to see if I got any true value from those things. I wish there was a list I could hand you and say, here are the hundred things you should own and then you'll be happy, right? That'd be great. And it'd be real simple. It'd be super easy too. like, wow, here's the formula. But the truth is the things that add value to my life, they might get in your way and vice versa. But do you feel like just looking around your house like, eh, I can get rid of this. Oh, I do it all the time. Yeah, my, Uh my wife and I are constantly interrogating the things that we own because the truth is something that added value yesterday may not add value tomorrow certainly something that added value a decade ago may not add value today you don't get down to those hundred items or thousand items or ten thousand items that you own and now you're complete no it's continuing to interrogate those because oh yeah i really enjoyed this during that chapter but it's time to graduate it's like when you left high school you graduated from it if not you end up getting divorced from an item You're like oh this is causing so much pain and misery i want to get rid of it why not just graduate when i'm done with it i'm done with it but is there ever a moment where like six months later or a year or two years later ah damn i wish i had those shoes you know yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> no i yeah it just it doesn't it doesn't really work that way i mean <laughs> regret is is usually you know the story that we tell ourselves about the way things could have been 
had I done something differently, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the truth is that I've gotten rid of all of my things. I even did an experiment once where I got rid of all of my favorite things. Really? Really difficult. Yeah, because I told myself, like, well, here's my favorite shirt, my favorite shoes, my favorite pair of pants. Someone asked me in an interview one time, very early on, what, what's your favorite shirt? What's your favorite shoes? What's your favorite pair of pants? And I gave him the answer and I said, but you know what? They're just my favorites because I say they're my favorites. Mm -hmm. I can let go of anything. I can let go of these. And it was difficult because, oh, I really like that. There's some sentimentality tied up in it. But letting go of that proved to me I can let go of anything else that's in my closet. If I got, got rid of my favorite things, guess what happens? Something else steps up and becomes your favorite. And they're just material possessions. So and, interesting. And, you know, and if, I, if I hold on to it, you know what? Then eventually it's no longer going to be my favorite. If I let it go in advance, then that's fine too. You know, my a couple of years ago, well, more than a couple of years ago, my father, my, my in-laws lost their home in a fire, lost everything. And my mother-in-law's upset by it. My father-in-law's like, I'm free. <laughs> because mm. I had never felt freer. <laughs> yes. Our our last book, um, Love People Use Things, which we did through a big traditional publisher, which I don't think I would ever do again. By the Why? Way. Go ahead. Why not? Um, I I'm just not good at working for people. Wait, you um, feel you feel like you're working for them? You wrote a book and you feel like you're working for them? I just don't like subordinating myself to uh, their ideas. And I think that industry, mm -hmm. while it makes sense for some people, doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, ironically, it was our, our least selling book. Even though it was a New York Times bestselling book, it was by far our least selling book. Orders of magnitude less. Really? Uh, yeah, not even close. What, what what because you think they changed the content so much that it didn't resonate anymore? Uh, no, I mean I think it's probably our best technically best written book technically. Uh -huh. Um but um uh when you when you do that I think sometimes you can remove the 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 heart from it. And I also think that like we I subordinated myself to them because they must know best how to mm -hmm. publish this thing. And but the truth is, like, no, I know best how to get my stuff. I intuitively know best how to what wow. resonates with people. And I've learned what resonates with because I've spent time in the trenches. I mean, this is the only the only thing that I've done for the last I've done it for 12, 13 years now. And I'm connecting with people every day and I figure out what resonates. I know what resonates with them. And someone in an ivory tower who is really smart and has the best of intentions, they may not know what's going to resonate with an audience the way that I do. I'm so happy you said that, but is it also the marketing? What was it because they didn't really market it the way you could market it? Or, or Yeah, absolutely. I mean, eventually I had to hire my own publicist to go out and market the book. Right, out of your own pocket, yeah. Of course, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so and, and it's like, well, I already did that with my own stuff. Like when I started independently publishing, started my own publishing company, I can do that on my on my own now they do a good job of distribution and stuff but let's let's be honest here what's the real distribution do what's i really the... need my do i need my book to be in target uh <laughs> dude you were just listening to my conversation because i had a, i was in, i did a did a, I did a podcast yesterday. I said the same exact thing. I said, do I really, it's, it's Barnes and Noble. Well, a lot of people don't even go to Barnes and Noble. They get their books online. So what difference does it make? You know, yeah, do I need my book in Target? Yeah. I mean, I can get books in Barnes and Noble. That's pretty easy. Um, uh -huh. But you can get books in Target. It's a little bit more difficult. You can do that stuff on your own as well. It, it's not as easy as having someone else do it for you. But guess right. what? I, the lesson I learned from this is having someone else do it for me means it won't be done the way that I want it done. But what is the difference between, you said this earlier, I, I between start, starting your own publishing company and and indie publishing on your own, like what are the differences really? I, I'm not sure I follow the question. The difference well, between you what? said you started you said you started your own independent you know publish, publishing company. Yeah. What, why? Like, what's the difference between that and you know self publishing on a platform? Yeah, yeah. So the biggest difference I think is quality control. When you think about an indie band versus a garage band, uh -huh. the garage band's having fun and it's great. And you could even record that music and it's not meant for a mainstream release to the public. It's maybe not even meant to be consumed by the public necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe for a small group of friends or something like that. But it's a waste of time if you tried to, if you filled up a theater and you put a, a jam band up on stage. Um most people aren't going to get the same amount of value they would from a really solid indie band, right? Uh, I mean, I think the pinnacle of that is someone like Radiohead who has all of the quality control of a major label, but they do things independently now. But you have so many other artists. I have a bunch of friends like my friend Griffin House or Matt Nathanson who 
makes really great songs independently. They don't require a major label, but all of the quality control is there. The distribution, the the editing, the okay. um the the mixing, the mastering. And so we have but a whole you're not process. actually printing it yourself. In other words, you're still using a platform to print it, but you're just when you say yeah. quality control, you mean of the the written word quality control. Yeah. I mean, all the, all of the above. We, we've done both. We, we've we've used we've done printing of our own books, uh -huh. um, but also, I mean, yeah, the the tools are out there now that you can do print on demand. And and right. how awesome is that as a tool? But the quality control in terms of like, okay, let's hire an actual editor. Right. Let's have a cover designer. Let's right. have someone do actual typeface layout so you're not doing it on your own. Someone who knows what they're doing, a professional to do this. Let's do proofreaders and alpha readers and beta readers. Mm -hmm. Having a, an actual quality control process yes. okay. as opposed to like, oh, you know what? I whipped this up in Word. I'll get my buddy to look at right. it. And once he's looked at it, then I'm just going to throw it up on Amazon. Got no, it. let's let's go through the same process that a major publishing company would go through. Why can't we do that on our own? Mm -hmm. and so you realize that oh wait i can do it on my you can own. do it were you finding when you were working when you did it, and i know i'm keeping you along and i promise and i really appreciate all this because i'm just uh I'll, every time you ask you say something i'll have four more questions so but i won't i won't take you much longer but do you find when you're dealing with these publishers and you're getting notes part of me feels like they're just frustrated writers <laughs> they wish they, <laughs> they wish they were you in other words do you find that or no yeah, I mean that. Yeah, I I have, but that's probably just me projecting uh -huh. some of my own insecurities onto them, right? Because all writers are frustrated writers. Yeah, ultimately, yes. <laughs> uh, Stephen King's a frustrated. Yes, writer. Yes, I right? agree with that. John Grisham is a is a frustrated writer, and I think this genders pretty significantly too. Mm -hmm. uh, strangely, most of my audience are women, um, and uh, uh, really? that was unintentional, but. I found that uh, when I talk to women writers, there's a lot more joy and happiness and contentment there. When I talk to male writers, a lot of it is just like frustration and mm -hmm. and and pulling one's hair out or trying to put one's head through a wall. Um, yeah, I, I, I found that uh, for whatever reason, and that's not uh, a heuristic that I would live by. I mean, it's not that all women writers are joyous and all male writers are miserable, but it does seem to to slope that way. So interesting, you know, for what it's worth. And I, one of the reasons for what it's worth. So I, you know, I'm a TV writer, I've worked for the studios all my entire career. And I said recently, and people are surprised when I say this, that I don't write what I want to write. I wrote what people pay me to write. Yeah. And there's a big difference. And, you know, yeah. So when I want to write something on my own, I do it on my own and with no expectations, but yeah, I, I, I get, you know, it's a job. So I'll, I got to take the notes, you know, that's right. Take, yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the publishing process with a major publisher was was similar in that. I also, I, I don't generally do deadlines. And that was one of the worst things ever happened to me was to have a deadline. I know really? some people it's really helpful for them. For me, it's crippling and anxiety producing. And it makes it, it strips all the joy out. The joy I love right. writing. I write right. every day. But if you sit me down and say you have to write, I'm like, oh, what do you mean I have to? That's why I never did well in school. Just, you're, you're being told to read something or told to write something or told to do something. I just don't like that. And is it mostly nonfiction, though, you're writing now? now? Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. the most part. Yeah. So interesting. Joshua, I'm so appreciative of you lending me your, all this time and, and just getting to know all about your story here. Uh, I want every, I, Honestly, I want everyone to go check out uh, you know, The Minimalists. Go to their website. Check out watch their it's, it's one of the most important things you'll watch is how getting rid of stuff will make you feel, feel freer and uh yeah and you'll feel richer in the process uh go check them out i can't i can't thank you enough for joining me here is there any other advice you have any any parting words that last last words love people and use things the love, opposite never works yeah w wonderful joshua thank you so much everyone and thank you for joining me what a great conversation So now we all know what the hell Michael Jam is talking about. If you're interested in learning more about writing, make sure you register for my free monthly webinars at michaeljammon.com slash webinar. And if you found this podcast helpful or entertaining, please share it with a friend and consider leaving us a five-star review on iTunes. That really, really helps. For more of this, whatever the hell this is, follow Michael Jammon on social media at Michael Jammon Writer. And you can follow Phil Hudson on social media at Phil A. Hudson. This podcast was produced by Phil Hudson. It was edited by Dallas Crane. And music was composed by Anthony Rizzo. 
And remember, you can have excuses or you can have a creative life, but you can't have both. See you next week.